to lesson 12, style, licks and tricks. Up until this point, we've covered many, many vocal techniques that will assist you in becoming a great singer. But what about being a great performer, a great storyteller, a unique artist? Well, that's exactly where we're at at this point in the program. During this lesson, we're going to begin looking into some of the ways you can style your singing to fit various different genres or styles of music so that you can better express yourself as a performing artist. So let's begin at the beginning, okay? And have a look at what you need to consider when it comes to choosing songs that will not only advance your technique as a singer, but also enable you to connect with your audience. Firstly, it's important to understand that learning songs is not actually about learning a song. It's more about learning through it. I've had students in the past that learn a song and without having mastered singing it, or at the very least, worked through uh, applying good vocal techniques into the song, they request a new song. And whilst I encourage students to have more than one song that you're currently working on, as this gives you a wider variety of challenges, I also re uh, recommend sticking with it until you feel you've implemented and engaged the technical aspects of healthy singing within the song. It's true that you needn't stick with a song until you can sing it exactly like the original singer, for example, but at least until you feel that you've learned how to apply the correct techniques in order to sing all the notes with control and expression to the height of your current skill level. Having a repertoire of songs that you know but can't sing with conviction or control is the same as not having a singable repertoire. So how do you go about choosing a song to sing? Well, as a teacher, I've always placed importance on choosing repertoire or songs that are emotionally fulfilling to sing. The main reason for this is that the student's heart and mind seems to stay more open to the particular song chosen, therefore encouraging them to put their whole selves into it, which in turn helps them and their audience to get more out of it. Having said that, I've also had students that will only sing songs that they like, most of which are from the same genre. And the problem with this type of rigidity is that studying one style of singing actually puts limits on the opportunities to challenge yourself vocally, therefore limiting the amount of progress you make. Learning to sing one particular style won't make you a well-rounded singer. It just makes you able to use your voice in one certain way. Let me give you an example. How many times have you heard a classical singer who has only studied classical singing come on stage and murder a pop song by singing it with a classical tone? You know, put simply, it isn't an authentic presentation of the style of music it was written in and it's simply not the correct interpretation as designed by the composer or the songwriter. And at the end of the day, let's face it, it just doesn't sound good. So I want to be clear in saying that yes, you will benefit from choosing repertoire that you can connect with emotionally, but at the same time, don't limit yourself to songs and styles that you already know you like or styles that you are already familiar with singing. Broaden your horizons and open yourself up to learning many different styles. In other words, if you truly want to develop your voice to its fullest potential, then now is the time for you to let go of any preconceived ideas on what type of music you think suits you and open yourself up to learning some new stuff. When you do this, you'll develop a clear idea on where you want to go with your voice and how you can play to the strengths of your current vocal abilities or what you need to do to expand them in order to sing different repertoire. So the message is here, be open to new styles 
and developing your vocal versatility. All right, so the next thing you should consider when choosing a new song is, is it in your singable range? All right, during the next few lessons, uh, during the first few lessons with a student, I often offer or suggest a selection of songs that they can begin building their repertoire with. Together with the student, these songs are chosen very carefully and are usually focused on their current singable range of notes plus notes that step beyond that by one or two half steps okay not a very great amount they're usually also fairly simple in melodic structure it's important to start with songs that don't have too wide a range and that also have relatively simple melodies that are easy to follow and learn. So if you're a beginner and you're still developing and working on expanding your vocal range, trying to sing songs by Mariah Carey or Bruno Mars, for example, is probably too much of a stretch between where your voice is at technically now and where the voices of these particular artists are, you know? So instead, um, depending on where you are, of course, songs like the ones included in this program, Hallelujah, uh, Someone Like You from Jekyll and Hyde, and also Feeling Good, um, which all span about an octave and a half or one and a half scales, are more ideal songs to begin with because whilst they're still encouraging you to use all of your vocal registers, they're not requiring that you go too far beyond the standard vocal range for a beginner, um, which in my experience is commonly somewhere between one and one and a half octaves. Okay, so what can you look for in a song that will help you develop your vocal technique? Some of the questions you might ask yourself to reveal the answer to this question are, how is my breathing technique? Okay. Is my tone shaky or uneven when I sing or hold longer notes? Do I run out of air on longer phrases or even on the shorter ones? And what's a song that has longer phrasing that could help with this? All right. Do I find high notes easy to sing? Okay. Do I need more opportunities to practice them? Do I strain to reach them? What's a song that is in a key suitable for my vocal range that could help me with this by requiring me to sing slightly higher than I'm used to singing? All right, what about how is my overall vocal technique? Do I experience vocal breaks or tension when I sing? Is my tone weak or breathy? What song could I train with that has a melody which lingers around the area or group of notes that I commonly experience vocal breaks or strain? What about my characterization? Am I a great storyteller or do I need to work on my physical expression? Okay? Do I look uh, do, do I lock up on stage, you know? Do I find it difficult to know what to do when I'm singing? Now, what about training with some musical theatre songs? What's a great song that is sung by a strong character that requires both physical actions and greater use of the stage? So these are just some examples of the questions you could ask yourself before choosing a song. Remember, you're learning through the song, so be sure to implement all of the relevant strategies, techniques, and performance skills that you're able to learn through this program, all right? And once you've mastered the song to the best of your current technical and performance ability, you're then ready to perform it for an audience. And I wanna make a point of saying here that you don't have to be technically perfect or at a professional level before you can go out and sing in front of an audience. You know, in fact, it's necessary to get performance experience in order to learn more, develop more, and refine your technique and performance skills to higher and higher levels. The best way to learn how to sing well is to practice your strategies and techniques through exercises. Then, 
fully implement those techniques and strategies into whatever song you're singing. No use doing exercises and going, okay, then I'm doing my practice now, and now I'll go and sing my song and do something completely different. You've got to implement those exercises, the, the techniques and the concepts that they teach you into the song that you're singing. All right. Next, you want to test drive all of the above in a performance setting, and then go back to choosing more repertoire that will help you to refine all of that. As I mentioned earlier in this lesson, it's important to test drive your voice in as many different styles as possible. Listening to as many singers as you can who sing different styles of music will help you to learn the idiosyncrasies that define the genre. Without that kind of study or attention to detail, it's quite common to hear singers applying the only technique they know to every different style without changing the way they approach the song technically and stylistically. For example, if I was to sing a pop song with a classical tone, uh, because let's pretend that's all I know how to do, we'd have something that sounds like this. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, and the major lift. Okay? <laughs> or what if I only know how to sing in the pop style, yet I'm attempting to sing an operatic aria? I might sound something like this. Oh, mio babino caro, mi piace bello. No good. Or what if I only sing jazz and I'm trying to sing a theatre song? You know, maybe I'd sound like this. Someone like you found someone like me and suddenly nothing will ever be the same. Mm -mm -mm. You know, it's no good. As you can hear and see, none of these renditions engage you except for the silliness but you're my audience and you're not engaged and none of those songs sounded authentic. However, what if I could sing in all three different styles, pop, opera and theatre, and applied the correct approach to the corresponding style? So for that first song, instead of sounding out of place by using a classical technique and approach, I would change the placement of my tone and make it a little more pharyngeal, you know, rather than having my soft palate raised higher, which is used in classical singing. I would also add a little breathiness here and there and maybe even some glottal stopping, okay? I'll, I'd also make my, vocal, my vowels more speech-like and less rounded. So instead of sounding like this, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth. You know, I would sound like this. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, minor fall and the major lift. Okay? So notice the difference in the way I'm able to express the lyrics more authentically and appropriately. It's much more musical and engaging for you, right? And that's because I'm using the way the music is written, the nature of the story, and I'm changing my technical approach to those things to deliver the message in the way that it was intended by the composer to be delivered. All right. So what about the second song? Well, here I'd do the opposite of what I just did with the pop song. So instead of singing an aria like this, Oh, my baby, no caro. I'd round my vowels by raising my soft palate more. I'd carry my line through the phrase and keep my breath flow and tone consistent and clear. And I'd sing more like someone from the early 1900s because although the story is set in the 13th century or something, the music was written and styled 
to suit the popular style of music in the early 1900s. So applying that technique, I'd sound more like this. Now, doesn't that sound more like the operatic aria it is? Again, I'm lining my technical approach up with the story, the setting and the style. All right, so for the last song, instead of being so laid back and, you know, with that rhythm and flow of the story, I'd sing it more poetically or theatrically and use more animation in both my voice and my action. It's theatre, okay? I'd even out and lengthen my vocal line a bit more and clear up the tone slightly. So instead of sounding like this, Someone like you found someone like me Suddenly nothing would ever be the same all right? It would sound more like this. Cause someone like you found someone like me and suddenly nothing will ever be the same. Okay, so as you can see, knowing your styles intimately helps you to become aware of what you need to do vocally and technically in order to sing that style authentically. And the best way to gain this knowledge is by listening to singers of different styles and analyzing what they're doing vocally or technically. You've got to listen, you've got to analyze. This is another example of why it's so important for singers to be excellent listeners. Singing is an art form. If you don't integrate the emotions and techniques required to produce artistic sound, your performance will lack truth and therefore the connection between you and your audience will not be made. At first, you might find that your emotional expression or interpretation feels false or theatrical and that's perfectly normal. Okay, if this is the case, start by reading through the words um, at, to find the emotional content of the story that that song's telling. All right, truly believing and experiencing the story you're telling takes time and an understanding of the words you're singing. As you read through the words, okay, pretend that you wrote the song about someone or something and ask yourself these questions. What is it about? What's the song about? What made you write the song? What is the emotional content of the story, i.e. is it a sad story, a happy story, an inspirational story, a funny story, an angry story? Mm -hmm. What do you want your audience to feel after they've heard the song? What do you want your audience to remember after they've heard the song? When it comes to deep emotional connection to the song you're singing, it's a really great idea to memorize the lyrics to the song as early on as possible. This is so important. This is because when you're reading the words to your song off a page, your brain is in data analysis mode or receive mode, okay? It's taking information in, which is the function of the left brain, all right? And so the left brain is focused on taking in and sorting through that data. This means that the right brain function, which controls your creative output, is on hold, so to speak. Okay? When you memorize your lyrics, you're better able to switch to creative mode and engage the right brain function to express or give out that information in a much more creative way. 
So in the next lesson on performance, I'm going to take you through the physical side of expressing the story of whatever song you're singing. But for now, let's take a look at a few things you can do that will help you to express the emotional content of the story through your voice. Okay, we've talked about how to begin working through a song in order to execute a technically sound and authentically stylized performance. So once you've come to a point where you feel you're in control of your voice on that level, how then do you begin to make the song your own? I have many people ask me, how do I find my own style, my own sound? Well, having said earlier that it's important to listen to as many artists and styles as possible in order to build our understanding of each musical element that defines each style, I want to say now that there's a fine line between singing in a particular style and singing like someone else who sings that style. For example, if you simply replicate a song that has already been done by another artist, chances are you'll not only be imitating their interpretation of it, but also imitating their personal style of singing. On the same note, I often hear singers say, oh, I want to sing like Michael Bublé, you know? This leads the singer to pursue their singing with a goal to sound like Michael Bublé. And this often causes the singer to manufacture the natural tone and unique quality of their own voice, which often leads to vocal problems because they're manipulating their vocal muscles to produce a sound that's unnatural to them. I believe that what, what most singers really want in these circumstances is to make their audience feel, in this case, what Michael Bublé made them feel. After all, remember that this is the element that really touches us. It's the feelings, not just the level of vocal skill. All of the music that we listen to and connect with influences our inner artists. So it's being able to draw on these influences without exact imitation, but with the intention of affecting our audience deeply with our own unique sound and personality. Remember, no one in the world has your voice. No one else can communicate with your audience from your heart or your perspective. It's up to you to inspire your audience with your never before heard fresh sound. All right? Be the first to sing like you and your audience will love you for it. So let's look at some ways you can add your own personal style when singing cover songs in order to remake them as your own. One way you can make a song your own is by changing sections of the melody of the song you're singing. Before you attempt to change parts of a song melody to better suit your style of expression and musicality, it's essential to first know the original melody extremely well. When a singer changes the original melody of a song, it's often seen as on the spot improvisation where the singer seems to be making it up as they go along. And yes, there are many, many singers who do this. In fact, most professional artists do this quite often in live performance. However, if you're a beginner singer, I don't recommend that you try this in live performance, at least not until you've got a sound idea on which new notes will actually fit with the accompaniment, which is something that you'll develop with time and practice. The reason for this is that if you don't understand which notes fit with the particular chords in the accompaniment and those that don't, it's very easy for you to sing notes that don't match the accompanying chords and therefore you'll be singing out of tune with the music. 
right? Having said that, you can sing what I call rehearsed improvisation. This is where you work through the melody of a song in very small sections and choose which notes you'd like to change and how you want to change them. For example, if I wanted to add some of my own feel to the song Hallelujah, I would first need to learn in detail how the original melody goes. After I've learned the basic structure and flow of the melody, I would then analyse some of the parts of that melody where I may be able to add more interest by changing a couple of the notes. For instance, let's take the chorus from Hallelujah, which goes like this. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right. Now, if I wanted to add a little more interest or intensify the emotion of the words, I might sing something like this. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, even though I kept that fairly simple, it actually made the melody sound quite different. And that's the key. Keep it simple, okay? When you first start changing a melody, don't try to change a whole heap of notes or add a whole heap of new notes because not only is it not necessary, it's also very difficult to do mentally and technically. Start by changing one or two notes in parts of the song that are repetitive. For example, like I just demonstrated with the chorus of Hallelujah. So instead of singing Hallelujah, I simply change the note at the end of the first Hallelujah to a higher note. Hallelujah. All right. Then the second time I sang the, the word Hallelujah, instead of singing it like this, Hallelujah. I added a little bit of a h, h, h sound and stepped up and then back down again at the end of the word like this. Hallelujah. All, right. All of a sudden, the song became mine. I had put my own flavoring in it to help me better express what I wanted to express. In other words, I sang the words in my own style, in my own way. Another way to add flavour or uniqueness to the melody you're singing is to change the rhythm of the melody. You can change the rhythm of the melody by altering the note values within it. For example, you could hold the shorter notes for longer and the longer notes could be cut shorter. So let's use the song Feeling Good by Michael Bublé, which is included in this program. Okay, so the opening phrase goes like this. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. All right. So if I wanted to change the rhythm of that melody slightly, I could hold some words or notes for longer and then cut some of the other words shorter, like this. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. So what I did there was when I sang birds, birds flying high, I held the note for a little bit longer than the original melody. And then when I sang flying high, flying high, I sped up a little so that I didn't go out of time with the music. So instead of birds flying high, you know, I sang birds flying high. Now, when you do this, and when you play around with the rhythm, much like when you play around with the melody, you've got to take at least these two things into consideration. Number one, timing. So if I held all the notes for longer, all of them, I'd go out of time with the music and it would sound something like this. Birds fly in high. Okay. Notice how 
after a short while, the music went ahead of me and what I was singing wasn't matching the accompaniment. This is because I was going slower, but the music was still going at the normal speed. Therefore, I was behind where I should have been. So if you're going to hold some words in a phrase for a bit longer, make sure that you speed some of the other words up in that phrase so that you reach the end of the phrase when the music reaches the end of that phrase. Okay, the other thing you want to take into consideration is the meaning of the words or the overall statement of the phrase. So if you're going to play around with the timing of the words, make sure that the meaning of the words isn't lost when you do that. Some notes will be written as long notes. Some words will be written to be held long to emphasize the word being sung. For example, if I'm singing Amazing Grace, Amazing Grace, the word amazing is stretched out or elongated to emphasize the amazingness of the grace. But if I was to shorten that word like this, amazing grace, then it takes away from the emphasis on how amazing that grace is. Another tip is to say the words you're singing and take notice of how you say those words in order to emphasize their meaning. If you had a word that you could say with more emphasis by drawing it out or elongating it, then it's probably a good word to play around with and elongate while you're singing too. Changing the key can alter the feeling of a song dramatically. Transposing the song into a higher key can make the song more intense, particularly if you use a clear, strong tone. For example, let's use Amazing Grace again. So before, I was singing the song in the lower part of my register like this. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So what would happen if I sung it higher? Which also means, by the way, that whoever's playing for me needs to play it higher too. Or if I was using a backing track, I'd need to use a program like Audacity, for instance, to transpose the backing track into a higher key because if I'm singing in a different key to the accompaniment I'm not in tune with the accompaniment and it's going to sound terrible because the notes I'm singing and the chords that are playing don't match. Okay back to singing Amazing Grace in a higher key. First I'll do it with more intense emotions and a more powerful tone like this. Amazing Grace How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me All right, notice how the song became more intense emotionally. Hmm? Okay, so what if I was to stay in that higher key but sing it with a softer, more melancholy emotion and a gentler vocal approach. It might sound something like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So you can change the key to a higher key and sing it as a powerful, intense worship song, or you can change the key to a higher key and sing it more sweetly like a soft lullaby, almost as though you're um, giving quiet thanks to grace. It all depends on the emotional content you want to include in the story that you are telling. 
So what if we were to change the key to an even lower key than the one I started with? That way I could sing it with a more chesty resonance and it would be more, it would be a more mellow sound but it would have that raw speech-like quality to it as though I'm actually speaking to God like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Huh? Or again, I could sing it more softly like I'm having more of a private conversation with God like this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Okay, it really comes down to how you personally want to emotionally influence your audience. Right, changing the tempo or the speed of a song can also create an entirely new feeling of the song you're singing. Now again, be sure that if you're changing a slower song to a faster speed, for example, that the meaning and emotional content of the lyrics isn't lost in the process. For instance, let's take someone like you from Jekyll and Hyde. I'll sing the chorus through first at the speed it's written in and then I'll speed it up. Cause someone like you found someone like me and suddenly nothing would ever be the same. Alright, now listen to what happens when I speed it up a bit. Cause someone like you found someone like me and suddenly nothing would ever be the same. Okay, notice how the romance or the drama of the song was lost. So if I was working on this song and I wanted to change it slightly to make it my own, I probably wouldn't use a change in tempo to achieve that goal. I would be better able to maintain the romance of the song if I left it at its intended speed and instead changed a few of the notes around which we discussed earlier. Okay, so what about slowing down a faster song? Let's take the song Do You Want to Dance by Bobby Freeman, for example. Now, when it was originally released in 58, it was quite a fast song and it went something like this. Do you want to dance and hold my hand? Tell me I'm your loving man, oh baby. Do you want to dance? All right. Now, later in 1972, Bette Midler rearranged the song at a slower tempo, along with some other modifications. And her ver version sounded a bit like this. Do you want to dance and hold my hand? Tell me I'm your loving woman, oh baby. Do you want to dance? Okay, so this is a classic example of how you can use a change in tempo with the right song, of course, to dramatically alter the feel of a song and really make it your own. Now, ultimately, you'd want to have an understanding of musical structure and arrangement when it comes to changing the tempo of a song, but it's not entirely necessary. Many singers who don't have this kind of knowledge call on people who do. 
They might have a friend or family member that plays piano or guitar, for example, that they can put their ideas to and work together with that person to come up with an arrangement of whatever song you've chosen so that it comes to life. Don't limit yourself just because you don't have the skills or the knowledge. Just find someone who does and give yourself the opportunity to learn those skills over time so that you can become a more independent musician and performer. So in the projection lesson, we learn about how to increase our breath pressure, increase our vocal projection, and we also learn more about how to create different dynamic volumes with our voice. So here are some simple ways that you can use those techniques in the context of a song. Let's take the song Hallelujah again for a minute. Now, there are various different sections or phrases in that song where we can use our dynamics, louds and softs, to create different emotional effects. The first phrase we're going to use as an example is this. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. Okay, so notice how the volume was fairly consistent throughout that phrase. What about if I use the techniques described in the soaring crescendo exercise in the projection lesson and applied it to that entire phrase? For instance, instead of singing the entire phrase at the one volume, we could crescendo or gradually get louder throughout that phrase which would increase the emotional intensity and help us better communicate the story to our audience. So that might sound something like this. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift, the baffled king composing hallelujah. Okay. Notice how it sounded more powerful, like I was really pouring my heart into it. And what about if we were to change the dynamic level after that point when we go into the chorus? So instead of staying at that volume, you know, we could suddenly drop back to a much quieter volume when we sing hallelujah, hallelujah, etc. So this is what we would all sound like this this is what all of that would sound like together it goes like this the fourth the fifth the minor fall and the major lift the baffled king composing of examples of how changing the dynamic levels during or between phrases that really help bring your interpretation or connection with the song to your audience. Again, make sure that the phrases you get louder on are those that lend themselves to extra emphasis. These are mostly, but not limited to, phrases that ascend higher in pitch, longer notes, that end a song like uh, like the end phrase in Time to Say Goodbye, for instance, which has a really long high note at the end. For example, <clears throat> So that's a great example of a soaring crescendo, okay? You can also use more or less volume on individual words that need more or less emphasis. But whatever you do, make sure that the meaning of the words is not lost, but rather given more life so that they hold more impact.
Okay, so now we're starting to get into some of the technical tricks that you can use to enhance your expression, convey your style, and make your performance more engaging for your audience. The first stylistic technique we're going to look at is vibrato. So very basically, vibrato is the effect that occurs when the sound you're making is oscillating or changing rapidly between two notes. And vibrato sounds like this. All right. So what's happening is that instead of just singing one straight note like this, I'm actually allowing my voice to move quite rapidly between two notes, like this. Okay, as you can hear, it's important to be free from tension when you sing with vibrato because it's a technique that requires the vocal cords to change positions very rapidly in order to oscillate between those two notes rapidly, which is what creates the sound of vibrato. As we've covered earlier in this program, to change pitch, the length and tension of our vocal cords needs to change so that they're vibrating at different frequencies or speeds, and therefore producing different pitches or notes. When we sing normally, even if we're singing some of the more agile phrases, the, this change in position is being con consciously directed and controlled by us. We are controlling the pitches and notes we want to sing. We're making them happen. However, when it comes to vibrato, the change in pitch is so fast that we need to let go of that intellectual control and allow our sensory faculties to take over. In other words, trying to mentally control each individual note that makes up the sound of vibrato is too difficult for the brain to process because of the speed at which the oscillation between the two notes occurs. However, when it comes to tuning in and allowing the overall sensation or feeling of vibrato to be our guide, it's much easier to focus on the feeling of vibrato as one sensation than it is to concentrate on and control a whole bunch of things we need to do with our brains and voices to make vibrato happen. And this whole idea of making it happen is something I just want to talk about for a minute. Firstly, many singers believe that a voice with no vibrato is not a very good one. And I'd like to emphasize here that this is simply not true. I understand that it's a skill that many singers really want to develop because let's face it, most people think that if you can sing with vibrato, then you must be a good singer. But what this often does is lead many singers who are anxious to be considered a skilled singer to imitate the sound of vibrato rather than producing it naturally and correctly and they often do it through unhealthy and unnatural methods to create that pulsing or wavering sound of vibrato. Unfortunately, this kind of pressure to add vibrato to their vocal line often then causes the singer to rush ahead of their current technical abilities. Developing vibrato requires loads of patience whilst you work on your overall vocal technique, which is what will allow vibrato to occur. Even though I've included, um, included it in this lesson on style licks and tricks, vibrato falls more under the category of style because there is no trick to singing with true natural vibrato, unless, as I mentioned earlier, you manufacture one, which often creates other issues in your vocal technique. The key is to give yourself, is to give vibrato your attention by focusing mostly on developing your breath control, your clarity of tone, your energy and buoyancy of tone, and your vocal line, and then to being able to execute all of those things in a relaxed, tension-free way. In other words, 
vibrato gradually or gen it generally goes hand in hand with your vocal development all right as your overall vocal technique improves which includes clarity placement and resonance of tone breath control and relaxation of the body and vocal muscles over time vibrato will occur naturally and with very little effort however there are things we can do and practice that will guide us in the direction of developing vibrato so let's move right along and do a couple of simple exercises to free up the voice in preparation for singing with vibrato So vibrato is not only created by the oscillation of two notes, it also has a lot to do with your breath flow and your breath pressure. I've heard and seen many teachers use the technique of pulsing their hand against their abdomen to create a, a, or a false or manufactured vibrato. And Look, whilst this can be a good exercise to introduce you to the imitative sound of vibrato, it is counterproductive. Vibrato requires a steady flow of breath through the vocal cords. Pulsing your hand against your abdomen like this <laughs> interrupts the breath flow. Doesn't make sense. For instance, when your hand pushes against your abdomen, the airflow is increased through the folds. When you relax your hand, the airflow returns to normal. This intermittent pulsing of the breath creates inconsistency in the amount of air flowing past the vocal cords. Not only does it interfere with the, the flow that's required to sing vibrato, but it can also affect many other areas of your vocal technique. And as you know, I've been on about consistency of breath flow and pressure for like the whole program because it's important, okay? Hence, you know, this pulsing, it's not a technique that I recommend you use. So instead, during the first exercise, we're going to focus on maintaining a consistent flow of breath while we make like a ghost and wiggle our way up a sirening scale like this. Ooh, scary. Okay. What this encourages us to do as singers is keep our breath flow and control steady, keep our vocal cords together to produce a clear sound. And also, the playful nature of this exercise encourages us to loosen up the voice whilst not aiming to achieve a beautiful sound. Again, we're just freeing the sound up, right? So let's prepare for the next time Halloween comes around and get our ghost voices going on.
next exercise, we're going to be focusing more on the oscillation that occurs between two notes when we're singing with vibrato. Now, as I've already said, vibrato is not something that's actually controlled through the intentional singing of two different notes. However, it does require agility and freedom. And although we spent a whole lesson on this last lesson, we're going to revisit the idea of agility from a slightly different angle. In the agility lesson, we were very much focused on the deliberate delineation and execution of individual notes. In this exercise, we're going to use the oscillation between notes that is gradually sped up not only to practice consistency of airflow, but also in, to encourage vocal freedom. So don't worry about your delineation. It's actually better if you just slide between the two notes. Okay, so as you're seeing this exercise, make sure your body is relaxed, but not so relaxed that you're like slouching or lacking in energy, you know, just loose. Make sure you achieve good chord closure. In fact, if it helps at first, sing the exercise on the NG sound. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, because this will not only help with your chord closure, but it will also help regulate your breath flow. And lastly, don't try so much to control the sound and make it perfect. Remember, we're just encouraging the mind and body to let the voice go. Right, let's give it a go. Okay, this exercise is the same as the previous one, but we're going to add a little extra faster bit onto the end of it. This is where it's really necessary to surrender all of your need to control the notes. Okay, this exercise is not designed to help you sound perfect. It's designed to help you let go of control, which often equates to tension and you need to free up the voice whilst maintaining good chord closure and good breath control. So no delays on this one. Let's get to it.
To describe embellishments, often in the form of extra notes that are added to a melody to increase the intensity of your expression, to emphasize specific words, and to amplify the emotional content of the story you're telling. There are many embellishments that can be added to a simple melody line and an infinite combination of licks and tricks that can bring a lifeless melody new life. In this section, we're only going to cover four common simple embellishments that can be used alone or in combination with one another. If you find it difficult to sing the licks clearly at first, that's completely normal, but your clarity and accuracy will improve as your vocal agility and overall vocal technique improves. So keep at it, keep practicing. Okay, note bending is possibly one of the most used tricks in singing. It's a really simple way to add style and flair to the phrase you're singing. Quite basically, note bending is where you slide from one note to the next instead of making a clean, clear, delineated transition. So instead of this, la, la, you would do this, la, la, okay? A classic example of where you can use note bending is in the song Feeling Good. So I'll sing uh, the first couple of phrases without sliding or bending up and down to any of the notes and then I'll repeat it with note bends. Okay, here it is without bending the notes. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. And here it is again with some bent notes. Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Did you hear the slide when I sang the word high? And also on, you know how I feel. So basically, I started on the note that flying finished on, flying, and then from there slid up to the note that higher sung on, flying high. Flying high. So let's do a simple exercise here that will help you practice bending from one note to the next. During this exercise, instead of using clean delineation, we're going to slide from the first note to the second note. Here we go.
Note bumping is another simple way to add interest to the melody, especially on the longer held notes. A note bump is where you sing a note and then quickly step up or down and then return quickly to the starting note. For example, I'll sing an upward moving note bump. La, all right? Or you can also sing a downward moving note bump where you step down from the starting note and quickly return to the starting note like this. La, okay? It's a fairly simple trick, but one that will add interest to your melody and make your vocal performance more engaging for your listeners. So let's do an exercise that includes upper note bumps. Ready? Let's bump. This next little trick is where we add an extra note between two notes to create a falling effect in the melody. Again, passing notes are more of an improvisational addition to the melody to add interest, energy and style. So I'll give you an example of a phrase from Amazing Grace that doesn't include a passing note and then I'll repeat it and drop the passing note in. So let's just use the opening phrase. Amazing grace. Okay, now I'll use a passing note. Listen out for it when I sing the end of the word amazing. Amazing grace. Hear how it made the melody more colorful and interesting when I sang Amazing, zing, instead of amazing, amazing, zing, without the passing note. So in effect, the distance or interval between the notes, amazing, amazing, zing, is a third, okay? Zing. Remember how we covered intervals in the lesson on pitch? However, instead of just singing the third and then the first note, ing, ing, amazing, I'm also passing through or via the second note on my way to singing the first. Ing, ing, ing. Okay, 
So let's do an exercise that will help you practice your passing notes. And while you're doing this exercise, much like in the agility lesson, don't worry if the delineation or clean transition between the notes is not there yet. It'll take some practice in most cases to get that delineation. So just stick with it and practice regularly. Okay, ready? decorate or add color to the melody you're singing is through the use of the mordant which is more often referred to as a turn and it sounds like this ha so basically a turn is when the singer sings the indicated note then sings the note above the one indicated then the note itself then the note below the one indicated and the note itself again. Ha, ooh, yeah, yeah. Okay, the exact speed at which the notes of a turn are sung can vary, as can its rhythm. The question of how a turn is best sung is largely one of lyrical context, musical style and personal taste, of course. For example, if I'm singing a pop song, I might choose to sing the turn with a more bouncy or disjointed rhythm like this. Yeah. Alright? Or if I'm singing a more classically styled song, I'd probably sing it more like this. Okay, which is more of a standard turn in its original rhythmically notated state. After you get the hang of singing turns, you can alter the rhythm or speed in any way you like. It's all about what you think best delivers the emotional content of the story you're telling. So remember, as you do this exercise, that the clarity of delineation you achieve is highly dependent on your current level of agility. So if the notes slur or slide together, that's perfectly fine and perfectly natural. But as usual, to get better at it, keep practicing it so that you're exercising and strengthening the muscles that help you to create that delineation. And when we sing this exercise, use any words that you like. I'll be going, hey, yeah, and whatever. So right, here we go. Let's have a turn at this one. Awesome learning, my friend. Another lesson that you've studied that has added even more tools into your singing toolbox. And that's really what singing with style and flair is all about. You want to have tools that you can draw on to best express your story, the way that you feel, the content of the lyrics. So each of the exercises and techniques in this lesson are only part of what you need to use to achieve this. You also need to draw on all of the other techniques you've been learning throughout this program. After all, decorating your vocal line and the melody that you're singing doesn't just require that you add in an extra few notes here and there or whatever. 
It requires expression and emotional connection to the story that you're singing. For example, when you're working through a song, you need to decide the color of the tone you're going to use. Okay, when you sing any given phrase, should you sing it with a clear tone? Should you add a hint of breathiness to some words to make them more sultry or sentimental? What are the words telling you? Is what you're telling your audience a match to that? Is the way that you're telling that story in terms of your vocal color and character a match to the story you're telling? It's so important to analyze all of this and then to the best of your ability, put together a performance that deliberately tells the story in a particular way, in the way that you choose. Okay, adding lib or improvising when the time comes simply won't cut it. You must know what you're going to do throughout a song so that you can prepare physically, mentally, emotionally and vocally for that. You don't have to be a musical genius to figure these things out. You just have to be human. Okay, learn the story, understand the emotional content of the words and phrases, plan ways to deliver that emotional content to your audience by using your words, your vocal color and stylistic decoration and really experience, really feel that story as you're telling it. Yeah, it's much like when someone says, I love you when they really don't mean it. If they're not really feeling that love, you can't feel it from them either. You cannot give your audience that which you do not first possess yourself. So get physically involved, get vocally involved, get musically involved and get emotionally involved with the story you're telling and then give it all to your audience. In the next lesson, we're going to learn more about how to use your body as an instrument to deliver what you feel to your audience. So I'll see you back here next time for a lesson in performance. Okay, until then, this is Ray Henry and happy singing.